Hello everyone, it is time for our live stream. Hopefully I did everything correctly and you can hear me okay. Uh, today we're going to be talking about LPS corals. I thought that'd be a really good topic to start off with. And uh, full disclosure, I was crazy tired the minute I woke up today. <laughs> so I was seriously debating, do I even want to do a live stream today? Because all I want to do is go right back to sleep. So I made, this up. I made myself a cup of coffee. And hopefully we can get through this thing. Hi, Paul. I um, grabbed some pictures. I grabbed some types of LPS corals we'll talk about. And I want to get into some of their needs. Here comes everybody. Hello, just another reefer. Hey, Thomas. Hi, Elmer. Hey, Rick. Santana's Reef. Yes, Paul, you were first. Hey, Bob, Neil, and Triggerfish. Hello to you, too. All right, let me turn this off. <laughs> I'm Mark from Elo's Reef, in case you didn't know. And uh, I run this channel, I sell things from our website, and I do appreciate the business when it comes my way. Uh, you guys help keep me fed and keep my fish fed in the reef tank, too. So because I was so crazy tired today, I was like, I'm not setting up in front of the reef tank. We're just going to do this in the office. Plus, I'm talking and showing pictures, and it seemed like putting pictures over a reef was kind of redundant. So I chose not to do that. Um, so... I say we should just get right into the topic. Uh, so let's start off with our with a popular coral. Um, this one has been around forever, and it's a good beginner coral. I should mention that. And let me switch screens here because it'll make more sense that way. Otherwise, I'm going to keep trying to scooch around and try to put the <laughs> coral not on top of my face. So we'll click to this one. So here is an Acan Echinata. Um, I, I'm going to change that. Let me remove that. I don't like that one. Let's try something better. Let's try this one. This is a hammer coral. So the hammer coral is um, in the Euphilia family, unless they've changed the rules of me again. And the hammer coral is actually pretty easy to keep. And when people say, what can I have in my tank? What's a new starter coral? And I always say hammer. <laughs> hammer or frog spawn are my two go-tos when it comes to it. But there are others on there. We're going to be getting into them. I see some of you guys already throwing out ideas. Matter of fact, I'm going to add some things to my list that I forgot to mention. What was my other one? Uh... Dang it. <clears throat> I can't think of what it's called, and I have it in the back of my tank. Oh, got it. All right, I got it on my list now. <laughs> Making myself notes as I talk. So the hammer coral, it's a single stony branch, usually about the size of your thumb, with a fleshy polyp on the top. And when you have lots of these side by side, it looks like this picture right here. And this picture was taken in my tank last year after uh, a bunch of months had gone by. But initially what happened was I had multiple hammer colonies all just jammed together like a really badly assembled bouquet. And you can just imagine, you have a bunch of flowers, and you grab some more flowers, and you grab some more flowers, and you put some more, and they're all just crushed together, and you create this big thing, but it's kind of sloppy. So when I did my reef set a year and a half ago, I asked Dwayne, could he uh, just plant the hammer corals a specific way? And he said, how do you mean? And I said, I'm going to cut all these down to where they're this tall. Every single one's going to be this tall. And it's going to be a bunch of thumbs, Okay. And I want you to just glue them side by side on top of a flat shelf rock I had in my tank so that they're all together. Because I'm tired of trying to intersect their cores and try to crisscross them like a bird's nest. It was a weird scenario. And I said, if we just glue it, it's going to look a lot cleaner. And he said, all right, whatever. So I handed him a tray of these hammers and a whole bunch of tubes of glue. And he just started gluing and planting and gluing and planting. And what I mean is... You take the coral, you dry off the bottom a little bit, you put some super glue gel on there, and you press it down onto the rock, and you hold it for about a minute or so, and maybe a little bit longer, and that's it. And then you take your hand off, and if it doesn't fall over, you did a good job. If it didn't hold, you can kind of pull it up and kind of move the glue and press down again. It kind of creates this weird webbing underneath. If you need to, you can put more glue. Uh, super glue gel is completely reef safe. I use the one from Polyp Lab. I like that one a lot. There's lots of brands out there. There's the coral uh, glue from Ecotech that's in a large bottle you can squeeze out. There's a gun that was made by Max Spec where you could squeeze it like a caulk gun and squirt it. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways of doing it. But 
I just handed him these hammers and he says, okay, I did it. And I gave him another tray of hammers. Then <laughs> I came to him with another tray and, I, and he says, Mark, I've never planted so many hammer corals in my life. And he probably put down, I don't know, 30 or 40 individuals onto the rock. And I said, don't worry, it's going to look amazing later. And it does. It looks amazing in my tank now. It just looks perfect. It's all the right height. It's all equalized and it, it grew all like it should. And, you know, it's gotten taller. So that's what LPS corals do. As they grow, the skeleton underneath the fleshy part I was talking about will be built up. More is happening. So the alkalinity, the calcium, the magnesium in our water is being absorbed by the coral to grow more skeleton underneath. And the fleshy part stays on top. Now, the fleshy part can either move up or what really happens is the skin, how do I explain this in a way that makes a lot of sense? You've got this stony stick, you've got this fleshy part with skin coming down the side, so it kind of looks like the tip of a matchstick. That's what we'll do. See, I knew I could think of something that was similar. So here is a matchstick, here is the fleshy part, here is the stony part. Just imagine it, it's shorter, <laughs> okay? So it's this much. And this fleshy part, this will, as the skeleton grows, the polyp gets taller, there will still be skin down the side. And because of that skin, you'll, if you look closely, if you get lucky, and you know, usually late at night when the coral is kind of retracted, you might see little baby buds popping off the side. And that's where the coral could start branching out and making a new head and another head and another head. So it's not just that you have this head forever, you will get more and it fills itself in. And it makes that filled in bouquet look. So if you were to plant like two or three heads in your tank, you could end up having this something really nice in a couple of years. So it's a really great beginner coral because it can handle a lot of what you put it through as you're learning how to do salt water. But then over time, it becomes this nice thing in your tank. And you can say, yeah, I've had that for two, three years. And people are like, how did it start? And you show them like a piece. <laughs> and they're just like, wow, okay, that's cool. So uh, it, it's definitely a good one to have. Now, the skin may... Um, well, it, it not may. The skin will um, always stay with the living part. And so as the new head forms and then pulls away, you'll start to see skeleton there. It won't be skin on everything like a sun coral. And that's another coral we'll be talking about briefly in a shortly. But um, the way the skin works is the skin is the living part. The bony part, the stone, dead. There's no life in it at all. And that is the part we cut when we frag a coral. So if you have a single head, you don't cut anything on it. You don't frag a frag, okay? That's, the, that's my rule. It's been my rule forever. But then when a second head comes off the side, you'll see like there's a V of skin. But then after a while, that becomes a full head. And then you'll look and you'll see that there's actually hardly any skin between the two because it's grown this way and this one's grown taller. And then eventually it's just skeleton, skeleton with a head and a head. And that's completely normal. So don't think you did anything wrong. Don't think you did something where, oh, the skin should have stayed on there. Why did it go away? That is how this coral works. It is creating an underskeleton that holds up the head. And it's kind of brittle. It's made of, uh, you know, calcium carbonate, but it's more like balsa wood. <laughs> so if you were to try to cut it, I mean, there's different ways of cutting it. And you can snap it. You could take a screwdriver in the middle and just press and it would just break apart. You can put it through a bandsaw, which is my preference because it's a nice clean cut. You could try to cut with bone cutters, but when you do that, you may crush it and it may look all splintered and broken and kind of hollow looking on the inside. That's okay. You could then take the stony part and you could rub it across a sanding block to kind of smooth it and then put the glue on the bottom and plant it. So if you have a piece that breaks off of a colony, you can plant a new piece somewhere else in your tank and kind of divide your 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 loot into different areas of the tank and have hammer over here and hammer over here there's no reason to have only one spot if you want to have multiple pieces because if something were to go wrong with one having another one in a different place is sort of like a backup and it it also uh kind of maybe helps balance out the look of the tank the tank might look better and then some people have used hammer coral as a divider between one type of coral and another kind of coral uh coral to create like a fence. And I'm trying to think what they were separating. Now I'm sure it was SPS on the top, you know, the acroporas and stuff like that. But I can't remember what was on the bottom, but I remember some one person, he planted all of these hammer corals like in a line, <laughs> like um, 
like a barbed wire fence. And whatever was underneath could not affect the SPS on top because the hammers were in the way. And I thought, oh, that's kind of an interesting idea. I'd never really considered using it like a barrier, but it worked for that person. So, you know, it's just something, some weird tidbit to keep in the back of your head that could come in handy someday. Um, hammer corals can be fed but they are not like obvious eaters. They don't do like shoo, grab it and slurp it in. So they have a mouth in the center down within the polyp itself. And so if you're broadcast feeding and you're turning off the return pump so the food just blown around in the tank for 10 minutes or 30 minutes, the coral will have a chance to ingest some of that food gradually. It will just slurp it in very quietly, completely unobviously. Okay, that's my point. Uh, if you wanted to kill all the flow in the tank and literally squirt food toward it, you may observe uh, a parting of the polyps and maybe you'll see the little mouth open up. And, but it takes a long time. And other things in the tank could steal the food. Uh, you know, is that you squirted the food right at the hammer coral, you know, right toward where you believe the mouth is. And you think you've got this going and you're watching it happen. And then a peppermint shrimp shows up and just steals it all and runs away. Or you have fish come over and snack on it and swim away. And you're just like, ah! So, you know, I, that's why I'm a big fan of broadcast feeding rather than trying to direct feed certain corals. It's not that you can't do it. It's just it's harder because then the livestock says, oh, that's where the food is. It's over there. Let me go there right now while it's still available. And so they will be a bit crime of opportunity by these these guys. Um, so that is it. That, that's that's the first coral I want to talk about is the hammer coral. Let me put a little star here so I don't forget where I'm at. Okay, the next one that I like, as I mentioned to you guys, was frog spawn. And that one here, this one's getting a little harder to see. So I'll just cover myself a little bit here. I wish I could make it like, well, I'm just going to do this. So you see that? That is the frog spawn coral. Now, the difference between the hammer coral and the frog spawn are basically the look of the coral. You know, it still has these tentacles that come off, you know, off these heads. But there are like little round circles, like um, frog eggs. And so that is why it's called frog spawn. And this coral is, again, a super easy one to keep. It's actually one I like a lot, and I don't have much of it. I have like one or two polyps that are, you know, being outcompeted by everything else in my reef, and they're just not doing well. So I, I, at some point, I'm going to have to get my hands on a new one. But this is actually taken in my tank years ago when it was doing much, much better, and I was very, very happy. It might have been one of the ones that took a hit back in the um, potassium situation a year and a half ago. I don't remember exactly what happened. But uh, it's a nice little coral. Again, the same principle, the same ability to go ahead and uh, you can cut the skeleton and you can plant it. If the skeleton's kind of long and you don't have a great way to mount it on the rock work for some reason, you may cut off all the little stumps off the edges just to have one long stick, like a <laughs> super long frog spawn, and you could press it into the sand and let the coral just stand up off the sand bed because it's embedded in the deep sand bed. Or you might be able to put it into a crevice between some rocks and put some putty around the, the stick part of the coral, the skeleton part, because that won't hurt the polyp at all. And then just let it grow. And it's, it's going to act just like the hammer does. It grows in the same fashion. And it will make multiple heads, and it will create a colony of itself. And it's very pretty. It's a really nice, easy coral to keep. Um, when it comes to LPS corals and flow, they don't like to be hammered with flow. They, you know, there's a lot of people like, oh, I like a lot of flow in my tank. And yeah, for certain corals, that's great. Other corals don't do well at all. And so they get very frustrated because they're like, why is this coral closed up? Or it didn't look like this when I bought it, or it didn't look like this a week ago. What, you know, and I always think, well, what did you change? You know, what have you done differently in the tank? What has transpired between then and now? And there are other things that could be happening. Things could be really wrong with the water quality, which we'll get into. But assuming everything's perfect and the coral's not happy, it could be either the flow is too intense or the neighbors are too toxic. And you may need to move it away from something else. But hammers and frog spawn can be near each other. They're, they're like uh, siblings. And so you can actually put them near each other and they won't destroy each other. Now, the one coral you can't put a frog spawn near uh, would be the torch coral. The torch has a strong sting and it has super long sweepers that come off. They can be six, eight inches long. And if you have a torch right here and you have your frog spawn right here and you have a power head pushing the torch slightly this way toward the frog spawn or hammer, the sweepers will come out and just sting it and sting it and sting it and it'll just shut down. It'll just close up. 
and so you end up losing you know frog spawn and other corals to it uh, another thing can happen between lps corals that you should be aware of it's very important it's called brown jelly disease i don't think we've established what causes it but i do know we recognize it when we see it and what happens is the coral of course closes up completely it gets brown and snotty there's like this weird like brown smoke kind of like wispy tendrils coming off it almost looks like a little brown fire okay and if that stuff lands on another coral it kills it too so if you end up seeing brown jelly disease in your tank the first thing you do is stop the flow in the tank you grab a bowl or some kind of container you put your hand down in the tank with the container you put the coral into the container and you lift it up trying to keep the coral with its brown jelly inside the container as you exit it out of the system so none of it can come loose and get on other corals and hurt them too. Uh, I would say that one of the likelihoods of brown jelly disease occurring usually is an alkalinity swing, but I'm not 100% certain that is the absolute well-known cause. I think it's one of the causes. And so if you are having uh, a situation where you're developing brown jelly disease, you want to remove it from the tank. <clears throat> Another method that you could work with is to siphon out what you see, but you may be siphoning out some of the coral. But usually at the point you see the brown jelly disease, the polyp that it's on that this stuff is on top of is already gone. It's it doesn't even heal from it <laughs> that I've ever seen. You know, I just, you know, usually that head is gone, but fortunately you had others. So again, earlier when I mentioned maybe put hammer coral here and put some over here, if something bad were to happen over here with brown jelly disease, the other one is completely safe because it's far away from it. So it would be good to kind of keep your stuff separated, you know, in a way where you have more of it in other parts of the tank in case something bad happens on the right side. You still got more on the left that you could replant and kind of rearrange things and make it look nice again. But um, that is one. So I wanted to show you torches, too. Now, I'm sure 99 percent of you know what torches are. The funny thing is, I don't have any in my tank. So I just went and did a Google search. <laughs> so here's some torch corals in case you need to see what one looks like. They have long, skinny, noodle-like or spaghetti-like uh, tentacles with a round ball on the end. They come in different colors. They are super expensive. I mean, look at the one on the on the far left and the one on the far right. From you know, there's one that's twelve hundred bucks. There's one that's six hundred bucks. And then you know, there's one in the middle that's a hundred dollars. Okay. Actually, that's the only bargain out of all of those. I see eleven hundred and fifty, five hundred, five hundred and thirty-six dollars, a hundred and seven dollars, four hundred and two dollars and six hundred dollars so i mean you know it's like oh torches man they are very pretty they're very popular it seems like every single person has a torch in their tank and if they don't they're not a hobbyist and so i guess i'm not a hobbyist because i don't like that torches sting other corals nearby and they just steal real estate but i've seen lots and lots of tanks where there's just rows and rows of torches i mean it's just like and there's all this movement which is i think the big draw i don't think it's I think the color is huge and I think the movement is huge. And I think between those two things, that is the, the big appeal for a lot of hobbyists. But the dollar, pr the price tags, oof, it's rough, man. That's some expensive stuff, you guys. You got some high end taste. Just a second. I don't know how bad that's going to be for you. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, uh, Jack was going crazy because she got some treats from Chewy. She knew. She recognized the driver. So, uh, you know, I don't have any advice on torches, but I would say if you're able to maintain any LPSs, you can maintain a torch. It's uh, it's not a hard coral. It does have a sting. 
I don't believe it can sting humans. I don't, I can't think of anyone that said, oh my God, my wrist got all burned from a torch coral. But some people are more sensitive to corals than others. So I'm not gonna use an absolute and say that could never happen. It's possible some people might get stung. Um, one of my favorite corals in the world is the sun coral. And this was one of mine back in the day. Uh, what's this? I don't know what I'm looking at. Hang on a second. Uh, there's no preview. All right, I'll just stick it on here and see what happens. Yep, this is it. So this was one of mine back in the day. And uh, I just thought it was so pretty. You know, it was just like a perfect little ball. And the reason I like sun corals is because as you feed them, they just close up like an anemone like an aptasia like a mahano it just it just grabs the food and you can feed it multiple times but this coral needs tlc so this lps uh absolutely must be fed regularly not once a week regularly you know it, i used to do a thing where i fed them every single night and that's why i had lots of polyps and if you do a great job and you keep them really happy they will spawn and throw babies into your reef and you'll see new ones on the underside of rock work somewhere and they need to be fed too <laughs> which is another reason for the broadcast feeding because if you want to feed this coral directly you can you stop all the flow in the tank you grab a pipette you squirt food down on it and then you watch all the pulse close and then five minutes later you come back with more food and you do it again and then five minutes after that you do it again and you can give them three or four meals in you know a 15 to 20 minute session but your invertebrates and your fish may come steal food. So one of the tricks for uh, feeding this type of coral, specifically in a reef tank, would be to put a, a two liter bottle, like a dome over it. You take a two liter bottle, you cut it in half, and you put the dome on top, and you can squirt the food right through the, the neck of the bottle and get into the coral, but nothing can go steal it. No hermit crabs, no shrimp, no uh, starfish, nothing's gonna get to it. The only thing is you gotta remember to remove the dome. And if you forget, that coral will get really, really pale because of oxygen deprivation. So one of the good ways to solve that problem is to drill a bunch of holes in your dome so that flow can get through it. It doesn't become an oxygen uh, de uh, depleted zone, but none of the critters can get in there and steal the food. And this is a great way to feed it. This is a considered a non-photosynthetic coral. It does not need light. It doesn't care about light. It actually doesn't even want light. It wants to be open at night. In caves, it is actually on the underside of the roof where it never sees sunlight a minute of its life. And the water just flows through the cave and the corals are grabbing food all the time. And that's how they live. And the crazy thing is they love to live under oil derricks. You know those oil derricks out on the, uh, on the Gulf? You know, those, those platforms? Those big pylons that go down into the, you know, into the muck? They're covered in sun corals. And so there must be a lot of... Uh, I don't know. I don't know if, where the food's coming from. I don't know if it's from all the workers on the oil rig. <laughs> you know, the waste that comes out from human beings being there. If it's just a great spot in the ocean where food blows by. But yeah, tons of sun corals under that device right there. Um, I kept these for a long time. I even had a separate little sun coral tank so I could feed them, you know, conveniently. Instead of trying to feed them in the reef. And they come in two colors. So here, I mean, they actually... There's like three. There's like a yellow. There's this orange one like you're seeing right here. And then there's the black sun coral. So the black sun coral, I think this is it. This was another one I got years ago. It's so pretty with the actinics. So while it's called black, it's actually um, kind of a hunter green. So you'll see the branches and it'll... It, it's different. So a sun coral could kind of grow like a really tight cluster of thick branches, almost not a ball, but just like a bumpy looking thing. You know, the black sun coral tends to grow like a long branch with polyps sticking out all over it, you know, off of each branch. And I was at a show in California and I saw what I was sure was black sun coral. And I said, oh, my God, where is this coral going after the show? And they're like, oh, we don't have any plans. Like, I want to buy it. I want to buy it. I want to bring it home. And so they said, okay, you can, you know, you just pay us at the end. And I did. And I came home with this big bag of water with this branching sun coral that was inside my frag tank in uh, the fish room. And it was a deep 
deep green. It wasn't black, but I knew exactly what it was. And then when the polyps opened up, they looked like this. They're just so pretty. They're just gorgeous. For the longest time, this picture was my computer screen background because I just love what they look like. Here, I'll zoom in for you guys so you can kind of appreciate what they look like. And you can see those mouths. They are very hungry creatures. They definitely need to be fed regularly. So if you are thinking of adopting a sun coral, you have to seriously consider that you will be giving it food regularly. Minimum three times a week, okay? Like target feeding this coral specifically. Uh, the problem is when you have to feed a coral like this so often, it could lead to cyanobacteria because all the food going in the tank, even though you're feeding this one thing, you just start seeing these red blankets happening. You're like, ah, and it's because the nutrient level in the tank is getting too high. So some people would train the sun coral to be opened at a certain time of day because it's easier for them to try easier than trying to feed them in the middle of the night. But uh, I know some that would literally like it would be open and they would carefully scoop it into a bowl and take the bowl into the kitchen and they'd feed the sun coral. And then when they were done feeding it, they would then carefully put it back in the reef tank. And that way they kept down the nutrients and from getting all into the tank itself. Uh, I never went to that trouble. I just made a separate tank just for sun corals and I really enjoyed it. It was really nice. And I had, um, I had them for many, many years. So if you are uh, a sun coral, if you're thinking this is a cool one to have, it is. It just, they have to be fed. All right, I've got another coral here that you guys might like. And it's another one of my, in my favorites family. So this was the one I got years ago. This is not the one I have right now. This is called a dendrophilia. And the dendros are like supersized sun corals. Now the nice thing about dendrophilia is that they like light. They benefit from the light and they'll grow. <laughs> and they can capture food more readily than a sun coral because their polyps are so much larger. Now they're not as big as a hammer coral or a torch or a euphilia, you know, a, a, a frog spawn. But they are big enough that you can see them. I mean, you know, it's not like you're looking for something that's cute with little daisies. This is a decent, chunky little coral. And back when I saw this for the first time, I was at a Macna. I think it was Macna Boston. And I saw it with my friend. We were standing there just staring at this coral like, that is so pretty. We were just like in love with it. And I said, how much is that? And, you know, keep in mind, this was a long time ago, okay? Like 15 years at least. And... They said hundred bucks. I was like, a hundred dollars? I just showed you torches that are twelve hundred. I'm sure to you a hundred's nothing. But back then a hundred dollars was worth some money. And um it was two polyps. And I was just like, oh man. And so my friend and I were sitting there and I said, What if we broke it in half? Because it's an LPS, and we each got it for fifty bucks. I mean, nobody has this coral. This would be a cool one. And so my friend, her name was Amy. She's like, yeah, let's do it. So she took hers to Vegas, such a combined to Texas. And I put it in my tank and it grew into multiple heads. And you can see in this picture, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight polyps. It's just such a pretty thing that I got, that started with $50, you know? And uh, really a cool coral. So let me, I took a, I have a second picture of it for you. So you can guys can see how pretty the polyps are. I love zooming in on corals. I mean, they're just so pretty. So that's just one polyp right there. And they love to be fed, okay? They just, they, you, if you want to feed them, you can feed them. But if you aren't feeding them, they'll be okay. Like I have, I had a two-head dendro that I got years ago about, I don't know. Let's just say I got it four or five years ago. And Dwayne was here during one of my resets because, you know, I bring him in here every few years to help me reset my reef because I don't want to do it by myself. And he took my two polyps, he stuck them under a rock, like in complete darkness. And the only way to see it was to like look into the cave. I'm like, why'd you put those there? He goes, they're sun corals, right? I'm like, no, they're dendros. And he's like, oh, does that matter? I'm like, they like light. And he's like, sorry. And I just never moved him because I'm that lazy, right? I'm just like fine they're alive whatever so then we fast forward what three or four years and he comes for the reset i said hey Dwayne, <laughs> you're the one that put those in the wrong spot last time this time you're gonna put them where they belong and he was like okay and there was still two polyps after all these years because it was such a terrible spot didn't die 
didn't grow bigger, right? It just hung in there and looked pretty, you know, if you took a flashlight. <laughs> but it was a bad spot. So we put it way over on the other side of my reef, uh, adjacent to the hammer corals, where I dump in food every night. And those two polyps are now like nine polyps. I mean, it, it's grown into quite a bit in the last year, you know, or a year and a half since uh, Dwayne re -moved, you know, moved them to that spot. I just felt like it was his job because he put it in the wrong spot. Why should I fix his mistake? <laughs> why, should, why should I fix his mistake? That's not my job. Yes, it's my reef and my coral, but he put it there. It's his fault. And if Dwayne is watching this, I hope you're laughing. Okay, so... If you want dendros, put them in a spot where they get light. Put them in a spot where they're gorgeous. Enjoy them. Uh, you have to buy frags. They are, I believe... I have this weird feeling... This is a coral that can't be collected from the wild anymore. I think that got outlawed or something a long time ago. But they are still available if you look through you know, sites that frag corals. So it's not impossible to get. And I don't know what they cost. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're $100. I have no idea. But they're super pretty, and I highly recommend them. I really should show you a current picture of mine. Let me see if I can find one really fast. This, well, I say really fast. It's not going to be really fast. It's going to take me a minute here. But um, let me do a search on my computer. Dendro. Yeah, of course it finds the ones I just posted. Um... That's a nice shot. You're probably like, oh, I've seen that, Mark. Oh, you know what? <laughs> Some of you have probably seen this. You know why? Because it's on the coasters. So here was that coral when Dwayne planted it. See? Two polyps. And uh, then later on, when it opened up, it looked like this. Beautiful, right? And let's see if I can find something more current. Here's a picture of it from above when it's half closed, half opened. And it's above that green uh, Pasilopora. But there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven polyps just in that shot alone. And then that's with it closed. Now here's when it's opened. Look how pretty it is. I mean, it's a stunner, man. It's gorgeous. It is so pretty. So I would, um, I would recommend you to get it. I would, I would definitely say get this thing. You know, why would you not want to get that? It's amazing. And then under normal lighting, because some people are like, well, I want to see it with white light. Here you go. So you see, it's a pretty orange coral, and it has some movement, which is popular. What else do I have here for you? I'm just checking. See if there's anything else that's worth showing. Oh, here, I'll show you babies. Babies are great. So here's what you want to look for when you're looking for new growth. I'm going to put this right in the middle of the screen. So you got this huge polyp on the right, and then if you look at the base, you know, that bottom inch that's kind of shaded, you'll see two polyps right there. And then if you look at the one dead center, um, on the stalk on the left, there's another polyp coming out the side. So there's actually three new polyps forming in this photograph. And I guess I'll show you this too, since I'm talking about dendros. This right here is called a walking dendro. And it is in my, it's in Kate's tank. Let me get rid of this wasted space here so I can zoom in a little bit. So the walking dendro is a dendrophilia coral. It's just a single polyp. It will never become more than one as far as I know. I think actually, I, let me rephrase that. Almost never. It's almost always one polyp. But I think I recently saw one that was like a double head. And I was like, what? That's never been done before. <laughs> you know, like it just doesn't happen. But inside the base of the walking dendro, this coral, lives a peanut worm. And the worm has its body inside, and there's a tiny hole in the base, and it puts out its trunk and grabs on the sand and pulls the coral across the sand. So my walking dendro literally walks around in the tank. Now, it likes the front corner, and so it's only been walk, you know, walking two or three inches. But I remember when I put it in the tank initially, it went everywhere. I mean, it went to the middle, and then it went to the left corner, and then it worked its way all across the front. And you saw almost like you know a kid runs out into the brand new snow, and you can see all the places they went. It was leaving those trails in the sand bed. It was really neat looking during the initial days 
of that coral being added to the tank. So this is another fun one to have. This one is not a newbie coral. Um, even though technically it's kind of hands off, I would still recommend that tank be established for a while and, you know, and, you know, be taken care of by a hobbyist that's been doing this a while because it is, you know, uh, kind of a unique creature compared to something standard that you bolt down with glue. <laughs> All right. The next one I want to show you was the Frammer. So I don't know where the Frammer came from, but this is it. So when you look at a Frammer, it is a combination of a hammer coral and a frog spawn. But it's literally every polyp on, not the polyp part, I mean the tentacles on the polyp are all differentiated. They're, it's not like you have two of them side by side and somehow they merged into one. Some of the heads will look like a hammer and some will look like the circles, like the frog spawn. It's the weirdest thing. So that's my that's a piece of my colony. I've got a whole bunch of them in the back of my tank. And then here is kind of a close-up, I think. Yeah. So now if you look, you can see there's the hammers, the big, long, uh, elongated section. And you see all the little bubbles. That's like the frog spawn. So they combine the name and call it a frammer coral. And, uh, you know, frammers are less... Um, less available not as many people have them so if you can get your hands on one it's kind of a cool thing to have because it's different you don't just have another hammer or another frog spawn you have a frammer and i actually was given some frammer a lot of it after i had lost a bunch of corals a year and a half ago and this hobbyist in the area says here's a bucket full <laughs> which was crazy and then i put it through my saw and cut off all that stony skeleton because there was so much of it and just had the nice heads and I put them down in the back of my tank on the sand and they have just filled in the entire back of the reef. And I wanna take a big piece of that, well, or even a medium piece of that. And I wanna put it in Caitlin's reef and see how it does because it'd be great if it did well in there. It would give me a new color because the tank desperately needs some green and it needs some, uh, it needs some pop. <laughs> so I'd like to put that in there and I think she would like that as well. So, um, I'm not saying Frammer is impossible to find, and it's probably readily available when you look for it, but it's just not something, it, it's not, like everyone has a torch right now. Everyone does not have a Frammer. So if you want to be different, if you want to, if you want to be special and say, I don't have a torch, I have a Frammer, you should be jealous. That should be your, your mantra, okay? Don't let people ruin your, your joy. Okay, uh, let's talk about Acans, because Acans are in the LPS family. This one here, has been one I've had for a super long time, and I've lost quite a bit of it recently because I was not putting my hand in the tank. So uh, I had some anemones just get on it and just sting it and just burn away a bunch, but I still have a chunk, so it's okay. The Acan Echinata, which possibly could be called the Micromusa Echinata, I don't even know, is a big, huge piece of stone with this skin that's continuous across it. There's no separate polyps. It's just a beast. And they start off very small. When I got this thing, it was probably two or three polyps, you know, three mouths on, on a small little plug. And I've had it for so long. I've had it like a decade or, so, or longer. It has grown really, really big. And the interesting thing to me about this coral is that there's different colors. You're, you're seeing some orange, some green, some hunter green. There's some baby blue. I mean, there's just like all these different ones all in the same coral. It's kind of weird, right? I mean, you would think it'd be a one thing, like just orange and green, orange and green, orange and green all the way across but it has created kind of its own look. And I don't even know why it picked certain areas to be this color and other areas to be a different color. But it's really pretty under, under actinics, and uh, it is a nice coral. However, echinatas are very much like torches in that they put out sweepers and they will kill their neighbors if they can. It was very interesting to see that they did not hold up against that anemone. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to have to go in there and start doing some... Uh, I have to remove some of these things to keep what's left of my coral if I care about it, right? So I got to deal with that. I'll probably do that this weekend because I shouldn't wait any longer. But uh, here's another kind of a can. I call them a cans. So it's old school, but um, like I said, people are calling her Micromusa now, which is kind of weird. I hate change. I'm sorry. So this one here is a rainbow a can 
Lord Hoensis. It might be Micromuso, Lord Hoensis. I don't know. <laughs> I want to stick with Acan. Uh, and short, Acan short for Acanthostrea. So these are individual polyps, but they are still on the same stony piece. So if you have a chunk, uh, whether it's a very small piece or you have a chunk, a decent part that's bigger than the frag plug, it's still one skeleton underneath. You're not. It's not like it branches out like hammer coral does or something along those lines. This is more compressed, but each of the polyps can wiggle in the flow a little bit as they rub against each other like buttons next to each other. And uh, they each can eat too. They all have mouths. Each one of those has a beautiful little mouth in the center. Anyway, it's a super crazy colorful one, especially looks great under actinix. Or if you have like a blue flashlight, you can make it glow late at night. You know, it's always fun to do. And uh, I've seen some beautiful Acan gardens. And so I do like to recommend that to people if they want something pretty in their tank, but they're smaller. They're gonna look great in a small tank. In a big reef, they kind of get lost unless you have a lot of them. And, you know, I kept saying, I'd like on the right end of my tank, you know, down on the sand, I'd like to have a, an Acan garden. And I mean, I have stuff there, but it's not doing great. It's just not ideal because the tank's just too big for these corals. I feel like they'd do much better in a smaller tank, like a 29 gallon or something where you could really appreciate them. And, you know, your focus is on that type of coral and not all the others. But in my desire to have a mixed reef and have so many things in the tank, you know, some things get lost in the equation. And, uh, but their ACANs are very popular. And the nice thing is they're not, the craze is over. So the prices aren't insane. Uh, for, for a while there, they just became the coral to buy and everything was insanely high. And I am, I'm the person that wants to go find corals that are like 20, 25 bucks a piece. <laughs> I mean, come on, there are some out there that cost that. And so if you can find a few and you can get them at a decent price and you plant them in your tank and you give them TLC, and you do a good job with your husbandry, you'll end up having these beautiful corals in a few years that are much bigger, and you can really enjoy them. You don't have to spend a ton. Now, I bought something really cool. Now, I don't have a picture handy. I'll do a search, but I don't think I'm gonna find it. I don't even know what to search for. Yeah, it's not gonna be here. Wait, no, that's not it. Uh, this one kind of is it, but I don't think this is the one I, well, what's the date? No, <laughs> this is not it. This is from 2011. Uh, anyway, it is what I'm thinking about though. No, it's not, it's not. And I can't find it on my phone right now. It, it would take too long, sorry. But there's a coral out there that are um, looks like an Acan, but years ago was called Micromusa because the polyps are much smaller. And I bought one that was a decent size. This is a bad example, okay? This is not it, okay? But this is kind of sort of like what I have in my tank right now. This almost looks like a bunch of Blastos, even though it's labeled Micromusa on my tank, on my computer. But I bought this one coral during the Jake Adams uh, Memorial fundraiser. And I saw this thing during the live auction and, you know, the camera went like, it looked over here and then it kind of just went across the tank to something over here, but right in the center. I was like, what is that? And he just moved across it. And I was like in the chat, what was that? Go back, go back. And of course, you know, they weren't going back. And then eventually, you know, someone saw my comment and the seller said, oh, that's a, an ACAM. We aren't selling that yet. And I was like, oh, I want that one. And then the next day I got, you know, cause this auction went on for three days. And on the uh, the next night, that coral was for sale. And man, I was bidden. <laughs> and it was like, holy crap, Mark really wants that coral. And I was like, I have to own that. Because the entire thing was continuous. It was just all these polyps. It was fantastic. And they were all really, really tiny. And so I've shared a couple of pictures of them on my Instagram. So if you uh, want to go hunting, you can go look for it. But um, it's really pretty and it's doing really well in my tank. It's not getting any bigger. I mean, it's kind of like a one and done. Like I bought it, I put it in the tank, it's done. Now, will it turn into something even more fantastic? I have no idea, but I'm just glad I got it. And uh, I'm glad I won the auction and you know, it came in with a bunch of other stuff. I, I bought a lot of corals during that fundraiser. I um, was, it was helping Windsor uh, you know, raise money for their unborn baby. And it was exciting. And you know, I got caught up in the moment and I looked at my credit card receipts. I was like, oh, 
<laughs> I went a little nuts that month, but uh, it was for a good cause. And I ended up kind of getting some nice corals, so that was nice. Now, another coral someone mentioned earlier that was a good one for newbies would be the candy cane coral. So I like that I'm we <laughs> wearing this shirt right now. <laughs> While I've got this picture on the screen, let me see if I can rearrange this just slightly here. We're gonna trim that off there and we'll trim off some of this stuff that doesn't matter. So we can make this a little bit bigger. So this right here is called the kryptonite candy cane. And it's another LPS coral. It's got uh, the hardened uh, calcified sticks that go up and then the tops are these green uh, buttons about the size of um, a grape. And they they glow. They are, so, they are like the brightest green ever in your tank if you can get kryptonite. And uh, so here I am with my Superman shirt <laughs> next to some kryptonite. But uh, I got those a while back and they were doing so well. And then I had this Monty coming up, but they didn't care. You know, they just kept doing it. And then one day Spock decided they tasted like Nori and ate them all. And that was that. But I really did enjoy them for many years. I had them for a super long time. And it wouldn't be a bad thing to get them again. Uh, it would be a nice coral to have. Uh, they're not expensive. They're easy to care for. They, they're kind of a put it in your tank and just let it be. You don't have to go to a lot of trouble to keep it healthy or happy. It just, it just lives. So that would be a good one for a beginner. And then if you're looking for something to put down on the sand, you could get a fungia. So these are some of the fungias that I grow in my reef every single year. My tank probably makes about 20 of these a year. And I usually try to get them to other hobbyists or I go ahead and um, bring them to a fish store for some store credit. But they are... Uh, they start off as little tiny discs and then they become bigger. And I have some that are probably this big in my tank, you know, like this big right now in my tank. Uh, so they are, uh, it, it just depends. Mine are the kind with like longer tentacles. Most fungias are more like a disc. I've also heard them called wagon wheels. I, for a long time, I kept saying, what are wagon wheels? But apparently that was a name that some coral sellers are using to describe fungias. But fungias live on the sand bed. They can fluff up and kind of become like a pillow so that the current can help them move to a new spot. And so they can drift around in your tank a little bit into uh, the ideal location. And again, there are another one where they just live and you don't have to do any hard work. Now, this specific one that I have, um, it, the parent, the, the coral I got in the first place, it died. And I left the skeleton in my tank for months. And one day I looked and there was all these babies coming out from between the little fins of the dead skeleton. And that has been where they're coming from for the last decade. Every year, babies come out of the skeleton and they grow larger and they scatter into my tank and I get rid of them, you know, to other tanks or like I said, the fish store, and then they spit up more. And I have two different skeletons in my tank that are pushing out babies constantly. And uh, so I never run out of fungias. Not all fungias do that. Wouldn't it be cool if the colorful ones did that? <laughs> but this one specifically does. The green one does. And then there was a guy who had a red fungia that was making babies. And I was super excited because that was the first time I'd heard that. But then something went wrong with his tank and they all died. I mean, he just lost them. And I, I was really disappointed because I was very excited to get my hands on a red one because I knew if it ever were to die in my tank, I'd end up with babies again. You know, so I was like, yes, this is... I need one of those for sure, and I, I didn't get to have it, so that was disappointing. Um, another semi-popular coral, especially popular in the early 2000s, was the Goniopora. So I, this was one I had um, back in 2004, and it was a purple Goniopora. And the difference between a, well, I haven't even said the other coral yet, but there's a Goniopora and there's an Alveopora. So the alveopora has 12 little uh, petals on its polyp. The goniopora has 24. So that's how you know the difference. So like these guys here, I mean, I don't know if you want to take the time to try and count, but there's actually 24 of those little appendages on the end of each of these mouths. And the, the, the flower pot coral was very, very popular. And there was a thing called the flower pot disease. And it just seemed like where these were coming from, the disease came with it and 
a lot of people struggled to keep them alive. And it just seemed like the red one was more bulletproof than the green one back in the day. But nowadays, there are like all kinds of different Ganyaporas, including ones that are called like Glitter Bomb and, you know, and uh, I don't know, Fourth of July fireworks. And they have all these names and all these styles and all these types. And, you know, I've seen little micro ones and I've seen larger ones. And there was a guy in our club when no one could keep them alive, he had one that was like this big, literally. That's like the size of a basketball, I think. And he had it that big in his giant aquarium, and all he fed that tank was flake food. And there was clownfish living in that thing because it was such a big coral and eating flake. And I was like, oh my God, that's insane. How are you doing this? It was so neat. So, I mean, not everything goes by what we read in the books. Sometimes the craziest... uh, perfect alignment of everything works out in a hobbyist favor and they can keep something alive that no one else can but these days ganya poor are being sold regularly people are buying frags of them and this is i think that's the difference too people are getting frags of corals versus getting wild caught from the ocean and bringing them in with whatever issues they may have had plus that wild caught coral had to adapt to aquarium life which is completely different and that's why it didn't go so well and i I feel like nowadays if you get a frag of one and if you've got the right food, and that's the beauty. We have so many types of food available these days between reef nutrition, growing your own food at home, uh, the easy reef products, the uh, AB plus from Red Sea. I mean, there's so many choices. And then there's been a reef out now. And of course there's been Polyps Labs, um, Reef Roids has been out for a long time. So, I mean, there's, all these different sizes and micron sizes of foods available now to really take care of the needs of these corals that were considered much harder back in the day than they are now. So if you're a person that wants a Ganyapora, you may want to get one. And, uh, but that's not an easy coral, in my opinion. It's easier, but it's not an easy coral. And then this one here, since I mentioned Jake, oh, I, I, let me go back to Elviopora because, you know, I talked about it and didn't, I want to show you the polyps. So you can see the difference here on these polyps. These have 12 around each polyp versus the Ghani that had 24. So if you're ever trying to identify, what am I looking at? Is that a flower pot or not? You can just count the polyps and you'll know if it's an Alveopora or it's a Ghaniopora. And then I was going to show you this one here. I got this funny looking coral years ago. It's a terrible picture. This coral just never in a good spot to take a good shot of it. But I got this thing from Frank's Tanks and I'm trying to trim off this other. The upper right corner is the edge of my uh, tongue coral from Australia that I've had for a decade. But this one here, I, I was at Frank's. And I said, that is one weird looking fungia. I'll take it. And I liked it because it had this super long, elongated mouth and it had all those bright green polyps, you know, just all over the body. It just was really pretty. And the body isn't really brown. It's, I mean, it's brownish, but it's got purple to it, you know? And so I thought this was really neat. And one day I was showing it to Jake Adams and he says, that is not a fungia at all. (laughs) And I was like, it's not? Because I've been calling it a funny looking fungia forever. And he said, it's a Lobactus scuteris. And he says, the reason you know is because of that mouth right there. And I was like, all right. So this is actually on my website. Yeah, my website and my blog is identified. So if you're ever having to look up the funny looking fungia, you can find on my website. Uh, This one is uncommon. It's it's not something you'll see in the trade very often. So if you happen to stumble on one, grab one for yourself because it's cool. It's kind of like a volcano. It um, mine is about this big right now and it will fluff up bigger. But because of the big tongue coral next to it, it can't move. It, it wants to scooch. And I've got this giant coral that's easily 14 inches long next to it that's just like a barrier. And they just sit next to each other. They don't even hurt each other, which is great. There's no stinging. There's no damage. They just exist. And uh, this was another one of those in the Fungia family where it's not hard to take care of. I haven't had to do anything specific. I've never had to feed it specifically. I haven't like had to push a krill into its mouth or drizzle pellet food down on top of it. Um, things I used to do back in the day. But this one, I just put it in the tank. I feed the fish. The fish poop all over everything. And the corals catch that. They catch it and they eat it. And <laughs> that's how they live. So um, that was a pretty cool one. 
So now that I've talked about all of these corals with you, um, I want to get into specific needs. So I'll just leave this on the screen and just talk to you. The um, water parameters needed for LPS corals are going to be reef parameters. And that means we want, our, we want some set point in the alkalinity range between 8 and 11. If 8 is your favorite number, stay at 8 all the time. If you are, you know, if your parameters are going 7.5, 7 7.2, 8.9, 8.2, 7.0, 6.0, 9.0, 10.0, oh, if it's just bouncing around, that's terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible husbandry. You need to have your alkalinity stay the same number day after day, week after week, month after month. Your goal should be as rock solid as possible to keep that number stable. So pick a number between 8 and 11 you like. Typically a lower alkalinity for a tank that has low nutrients. Low nitrate, low phosphate, low alkalinity. When you have higher nitrate, higher phosphate like me, you can go all the way up to 10 or 11 and it works out just fine. Plus the higher alkalinity encourages faster coral growth, which is nice. But um, alkalinity should be between 8 and 11. I, I just usually shoot for 9 and just stay as close as I can to 9 all the time. So if you're trying to copy me, just go for 9. Calcium should be between 375 and 450. So anywhere in that range is fine. Shooting for 500 does nothing beneficial. I keep seeing posts from people lately that are just posting higher numbers. And I don't understand why they're doing it. Because it's not even close to anything in the ocean. I don't, I, I literally, you know, I know sometimes things make sense or, oh, this magic happens at this number, but people are posting, yeah, my pH is 8.5, my, my calcium is like 500, I'm keeping my magnesium at 1500, I'm like, why? Why are these numbers this crazy high? So, 8.1 to 8.3 should be your pH, calcium, like I said, 375 to 450, magnesium, 1300 to 1400, that range right there would be good, especially for coloration of Montipora in your tank. LPS are not Montipora, I know that. They're you know, not even LPS, they're SPS. But LPS do fine in 1400, I can tell you that. So if your number is between 1300 and 1400, you're in a good spot. If you're down in the 1200s, you need to bring that magnesium up a little higher. Uh, potassium in your tank, if you aren't measuring it yourself with a kit, but you are using ICP, you wanna be measuring over 400 ppm. So it's an important element. Um, your temperature range, and when I say range, it's like the alkalinity, somewhere between 8 and 11, you know, somewhere between 76 and 81. But find a number in there and stick to that number day after day, week after week, month after month, all year long. Uh, my reef tank is between 76 and 77, and it has been for at least a year, maybe longer. Caitlin's reef is 75 degrees <laughs> all the time. So there's a couple of examples of core, and Caitlin's Reef is really easy. I mean, there's just flow and light, and it's mostly zoanthids with a couple of things like the walking dendro. But um, I lowered the temperature of my reef. I usually kept it 77 to 79, and when I thought I was going to put the angelfish in there, I lowered the temperature of the whole tank for that fish because that fish likes colder water. And uh, I just left it, and the tank's doing great. And I'm like, oh, that's great because the benefit is there's more of a margin of error if the tank were somehow to overheat. It, have, it would have more of a cushion before it ever got anywhere near 85. Because 85 is like the tipping point for many reef tanks. Once your water hits 85 degrees, the oxygen level drops, the fish start starving for air, and uh, they start dying. Which then, of course, raises ammonia, which then starts killing other things. And it's a whole thing. So we want to stay away from 85. So I'm glad that my tank is 76 to 77. I mean, I'm, that's a great spot. But if your tank does well at 78 to 80 every day, I'm not telling you change your tank now. That could be your choice. If you want to try a cooler temperature, you could. Um, clearly it works. My reef has been growing like crazy for the last year and uh, I've gotten lots of compliments on it, which is nice. But um, we definitely want to have a stable temperature and like I'm trying to help a, a client in New York right now <clears throat> and his tank will get really cold and it gets really hot. It just, it's, it's like a roller coaster on the temperature gauge. And I'm like, we got to lock this in. It cannot be bounced around like this. This is just not healthy for your system. So same thing for your tank. And you, depending where you live, you may have temperature changes like crazy. Like last 
I think three days ago, last week, no, I'm sorry, earlier this week, we were at 79 degrees. And then last night, we were at 30 degrees. <laughs> and then next Tuesday, we're going to be 82 degrees. So our temperature is like this outside, which can affect the temperature inside your house because maybe you have your house set to heat because it's cold out. And then, like I said, on Tuesday, it's 82 degrees, but my house is still set on heat. It's not going to turn the AC to start cooling the house down. It's going to be ready to add more heat because it thinks it's going to be cold. And I would literally have to change my thermostat, which I haven't done yet. You know, I've still been kind of selected at what it is. I tend to keep my house around 72 degrees. And so like, when it's a warmer day, the house got up to 76. So my reef, of course, would want to get a little warmer, right? And because the AC is not on, it doesn't keep the house at 72. So you want to make sure that your house, your ambient temperature of the room is not fluctuating so wildly that it affects your, your reef tank to where your tank is overheating for a day or two, and then it's back to its normal temperature. We want to try and avoid that. We want to figure out a solution for the warmer days to make sure your tank doesn't take a hit. So if you need cooling fans on it for two days, do that. And then put them away again because now it's cold and now it's back to a normal steady the room's always cool <laughs> you know it's just one of those things you have to be aware of and it, it's kind of a it's kind of a dance isn't it to make sure everything's right all the time forever um uh nitrate and phosphate for the corals they need some so zero and zero is bad <laughs> We've learned that because lots of people are dealing with dinoflagellates these days, which is a very bad bacteria. It's toxic, it kills stuff, and it looks ugly, and it, it, it's really hard to get rid of. So if you can make sure that you have some nitrate in your tank and some phosphate, that would be best. Um, the general rule of thumb was always, you know, two or three nitrate is all you need. To be honest, anything under 20 is good. And then for phosphate, the general rule is 0 0.03 ppm. Well. Anything under 0.1 ppm is good. So if you can have some phosphate and some nitrate, your LPS will be thankful. And if there's a lack of nutrients in the system, the LPS will obviously be unhappy. The other thing is flow. <clears throat> the flow in the tank is very important. And LPS don't want to be hit with, you know, directly in the flow of a powerhead. They, they need to receive some gentle flow. But if you turn your flow down to give it gentle and you have other things that need a lot of flow, you end up with stagnant areas, you end up with cyanobacteria, uh, you have nuisance algae because the tank's not staying clean because the water's moving th too slowly through it. So we want to make sure that we have our power heads arranged in a way where they're moving that water, but the LPS is in an area where they're not getting pounded. So if you had a power head up high, shooting water across the top, you have an LPS down here that's receiving what's moving back, it probably will be perfectly fine. So that's why we tend to put LPS down low or in the middle of the tank. But we try to put the things that like a lot of flow up high because that's where the power heads are. But power heads don't have to go straight at the rock work and straight at the corals. It can also be angled to shoot off the front glass, ricochet, and bounce back that way while you have a return pump pushing water in from the back or even pushing water down to curve upward. I mean, Anything you can do to create chaotic flow in the tank where it's never the same flow all the time is usually ideal. If the water just keeps moving in one direction all the time, you know, in a, a laminar stream, did I say that right? Then the uh, corals may grow leaning over because the flow is always this direction. And, you know, it, it's much nicer when your corals all grow into their proper shape and look like they would in nature. And then finally, the one thing LPS are not immune to are pests. And there are lots of different ones that can happen. They can come in as hitchhikers on your corals, and they can come in on one coral and affect all your corals. So that's why we always dip our LPS corals. Now, there are lots of products on the market, but specifically for LPS, I like Revive. Revive is a gentle coral cleaner. Um, it's made by Two Little Fishies. I sell it. Uh, I think it's like $11 a bottle. And you use like a few capfuls per gallon of water. You put the coral in there for about 11 minutes. You take a turkey baster and you turn it around and you blow it off and you inspect it very carefully and look for pests. And we want to make sure that we're not introducing flatworms or sea spiders. Um, we worry about uh, other kinds of pests that can come in. We want to look for eggs, egg casings, 
Um, there's all kinds of stuff that can come in on the LPS because of the skeletal base, which is another reason why possibly trimming off some of the skeleton is ideal because you're kind of just erasing that whole problem and casting it aside and then planting the living coral with just the, the little bit of skeleton showing right onto the rock work. So I would uh, definitely always dip your corals. And also, if you have a coral that's suffering from brown jelly disease, you can definitely dip it in Revive and you may save some of the tissue. It's a possibility. So it, it is a good coral cleaner and it's not super harsh. So I like that one. Um, trying to think what else I've seen on this. I know I've seen like sea spiders on them. I mentioned that before. But um, flatworms is the other one that we come across the most when it comes to LPS. All the other horrible bugs <laughs> seem to come in with the SPS and, and different types of corals. So I would say for LPS, you're just trying to look out for obvious things. But other than that, that's kind of it for our topic for today. Man, I talked longer than I expected. I didn't think I'd have a whole hour in me on LPS corals. But I do hope that you enjoyed this discussion because it was, um, it was timely. We hadn't talked about LPS in a while. So I have not... Um, looked at any of your comments. I need to start looking. And if you have any questions, we'll answer a few before I wrap this up because um, I think I just want to go to sleep. <laughs> I told you in the beginning I'm tired. I'm feeling a little bit better. My little cup of coffee helped. Bob says, do you see any feeding responses from candy cane corals? No, I, I don't remember seeing any kind of response from them. Um, specifically like if you squirt food at it but you may discover and it's really fun to do this look at your lps corals late at night with a flashlight after lights have been out for a little while and they may have almost inverted themselves and opened up with all these really cool tentacles i have a really nice picture saved on my computer that i'll probably never find here but um maybe i can show you this <sighs> I have this folder I was in earlier. It's got some killer shots in it, but. Oh, here's a different type of hammer I had once back in the day. I'll throw it on the screen since I found it. This one here. So this one looks brown. <laughs> Uh, but I think that was my pink hammer coral. It was actually pink. I don't know why the color looks like that. Um, I want to show you. Here's an A-can that I used to have. Really pretty. I... I went to a fish store and I saw this one coral and it was like in feeding mode. I was like, oh my God, so beautiful. Oh, here's a huge LPS I forgot to talk about. The Lobophilia. So here's a piece of a Lobo. I actually have some really nice Lobos in my tank. Lobos are really nice and they are self-sufficient. They don't need a lot of attention or TLC. They just need good water parameters. This looks like a torch I must have owned at one point. But I didn't have it very long. I may not find the picture I'm hoping to find. I'm going through lots of pictures. Hang on. But a, a candy cane coral, uh, Bob, can like open up like invert itself and then have all these tentacles sticking out all around the perimeter like it's ready it's ready to be fed and it could be feeding in the total lights out period of your tank that does happen in our tanks when we're asleep a lot of times we miss stuff here's an example of it right now this is a different coral not what i was looking for but you can see how an a can was ready to eat it did this in the middle of the night and i grabbed my flashlight and i was like oh then i grabbed my camera and took that picture so you can see this kind of response it can happen Oh, there it is. I think I found it. Yes. I can't believe I found this picture. Check out this thing. So it's a big meat coral, and it had these tentacles popped out. And it just, I mean, I've got another picture that's similar to this. This is not the exact one I was looking for. But um, it just opened up 
I think it's called a Sidneria, and it was really, really nice. So maybe I'm still going to stumble. Because I have this one folder for, like, special pictures, and I'm flipping through it. I can think I'll get lucky. But odds are it's sitting somewhere else than where I think it is. No, didn't find it. Oh, well. Anyway, so feeding responses can be uh, visible a lot of times late at night after lights are out. Harrison, I don't know if there's been progress made, um, but it has been a problem for some time now. Let's make this. Uh... Hmm. There we go. A little bit better. Let's see. Antony says, I love your show. Please never stop. Sadly, I had to get rid of my tank due to the house move, but soon we'll be getting a new setup. That'll be awesome. And you know what? I see the airplane in your uh, avatar, so apparently you're flying to this new house. And I do hope you get yourself a nice tank. And you know what? If you have to wait too long for your dream tank, set up a small one for now just to kind of make yourself feel better because there are some nice ones out there. Um, you can have a little tank with a few things, and it can just make you feel good. I had a buddy that was just like really frustrated because he really wanted this one dream tank and I just encouraged him and then you know he did it he went and bought some stuff like the next day and he had it going and it, I don't remember it was, seems like it was nine months later or a year later I was like Mark that was the best piece of advice you ever gave me I love my little tank <laughs> so that was nice ah uh, see I knew that I knew people were going to rename my stuff reef keeper says hammers and frogs have been reclassified as that sounds like a disease. <laughs> Thimbriophilia. <laughs> I'm sure there's a 60-minute commercial about that on TV late at night and some pills you can take for that. Thank you, Thomas, for the super chat. I really appreciate that. I just saw it just now. Um, Santana Reef was wanting to know, is there any word on the Hawaiian law that's being headed up? I haven't heard any news yet. So that could be good. That could be bad. Uh, you know, it just depends on what's going on with the... Uh, the news reporters out there, but I haven't heard anything yet. And I was on Facebook earlier. I didn't say anything. Let's see. Fat String says, this is my very first live stream ever. This is like my 600th, I think, or some crazy number. I actually was going to look that up earlier. Like, what number are we on? Because we've been doing this for years. But I did not figure that out. Hey, John. He's here from England. I'm here from Texas. Hinkleberry Toad Lipper <laughs> says, do you know anything about Blue Ridge Corals? Yes, I know quite a bit about them. What do you want to know? I can also tell you in the December issue of Coral Magazine, there was a multiple page article about uh, the Heliofungia, uh, Heliopora, the Blue Ridge Coral. But I've had one now for probably oh, 19 years. So uh, what do you want to know? Aftershock says, can different types of torches sting each other? I think some can. But mostly I see people with them all just near each other, and they all seem to be tolerating one another. You'll have to you know, check with maybe other hobbyists that have kept them. Since I haven't jumped into that, um, jumped on that bandwagon, I don't have the experience to give you an answer on that one. Sorry. Oh, I didn't mention Elegance Coral. Luke says, I'm getting an Elegance Coral in a few days. And that was the one I was saying. I put it on my notes. <laughs> it's right there, but I forgot to talk about it. Uh, I got myself an Elegance Coral. I've always wanted one. My friend Dwayne had one. I talk about him all the time because we talk on the phone all the time. So he's my friend. And uh, he had a ginormous one in his tank. And I was like, oh, it's so pretty. I love it. He goes, oh, I hate that thing. And uh, so then I said, hey, I'm thinking about getting one. He goes, why would you do that? Don't do that. And I was like, but you have one. He goes, I know. Don't get one. It just stings everything. It's too big. It's just, no. And I was just, I was just like, man, it's so pretty, though. It's got these long, like, filaments that come off with little balls in the end. They're colorful. So then it was last year. Someone posted a picture while they were at probably Reef of Palooza, California, and they put it on Instagram. The picture was insane. It was just so beautiful, it could not be a real coral. And the person says, yeah, I photographed this at the show. And I was like, oh my God. And then 
the seller of the coral saw my comment and sent me a message on Instagram and says, Mark, I've got that coral. I sell that coral. That's my coral he took a picture of. And I was like, well, I want the smallest one you have. So he shipped it to me and I put it in the back of my reef and I've done nothing with it, but let it just do its thing. And it, it's been super easy. And I know a few people said that's too much flow, but the darn thing's happy. So I do want to move it in the front because it really is pretty. And I think it'd look great on the left end of my tank, even though that's kind of a green spot and this coral has green and I'm trying not to put all the greens with the greens, but invariably that's what ends up happening in my tank so often. But um, yeah, I don't really, I, that was another one. It used to, back in the early 2000s, elegance corals had diseases that, elegance coral disease, you can look it up. There was articles written about it in Reef Keeping Magazine because it was such a beating. And it was like, uh, like the ones from Indonesia were the problem, but not the ones that came from another place. <laughs> It was like, wow, well, how do we know where they come from? When I go to the fish store, I just see a coral. I don't know its origin. And even if I ask the fish store owner, where did it come from? They're, they got it from a supplier. There's no absolute guarantee that one came from a certain place unless it was tagged and labeled that way to where it went through the chain of custody and you know for a fact where it's from. And I'd love to know where things are from. I, a lot of the corals I got, from, I got from hobbyists. And so I'll refer to them as that came from Ryan, that came from Dwayne, that came from Wes, that came from Rick. You know, I mean, different people in my life have given me corals and those corals grow and grow and grow for years. And I always remember who I got them from. And they, they might've got it from the ocean, but I got it from them. So it's even more special to me. <laughs> Discus says, I remember $20 torches. <laughs> Oh, Duncan's, that's another LPS. How did I leave that out? Ugh. Well, I don't know why I'm making a note. We're already at this point. But um, Rick says, my first reef tank was hammer, coral, frog spawn, Duncan's, trumpet, acan, zoas. They're still with me many years and many tanks later. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. And you know what? When you're setting up a new tank and you've got livestock from the old tank, you have these mini colonies you can move over and it already makes the tank feel like it's going instead of, a, a bunch of rock work and then you got all these little tiny frags glued down that are very obviously brand new but then you plunk in this decent lps here and another one over here and one up here and it just feels like you're making some progress you're doing something and you're making something nice so yeah that is the beauty of having those kind of corals let's see um <laughs> Jason says, upsell those torches and euphilia coral so my Ghania Pora coral prices can come back down where they belong. It's so funny. Uh, Jason is really good at the Ghanis and uh, has a Ghani garden in his reef tank. David says, How is, what's the best way to reach out about a custom acrylic job? Just send me an email. Sales at melovesreef.com. Do I have that to throw on the screen? Probably not. I don't come prepared. I see a zillion pictures, but I don't see that. I'll just stick it on the screen. I'll just do it old school. There you go. That's me. <laughs> there we go. Shrink that down, put this right here. So if you're trying to reach me about something, just send an email there and I will reply to you and we can figure out what's going on. Thank you, Lord Thornton Eddington. He says, these are the kind of videos I really like. General info based on experience. Oh, I see Andreas helped me out here too. Anyone? Santana, I'm reading it, but I don't understand what you said. You said anyone, oh, see the beautiful pieces polo reef unveiled that belonged to Jake Adams. Well, they had a, like a one hour live stream. I haven't watched that yet, but yeah, they had boxes and boxes of corals I got from him. Let's see. Then there's two people talking a lot. <laughs> Blastos! Blastamusa is another LPS coral I didn't include. I tried to think of all of them. 
So Blast and Musa are really pretty, and I had a really nice colony. This is a funny story. You guys love stories. Uh, there was a guy in our club, and he was leaving the hobby. He was selling his tanks, selling all the livestock, and I saw the post of these Blasto. I was like, oh, they're so pretty. I want those. He says, okay, yeah, just come on Saturday. And so, you know, I made the trip out there, and I, you know, parked in this apartment complex, and I had to go up some stairs. And, I, you know, I knock on the door, and some random person opens the door. And there's like three or four guys just sitting on the sofa staring at me, like hard, <laughs> just staring, like, like in a way, like you feel like there's a drug deal going down and they're the enforcers. And I'm just like, I was here to get a coral. And they just kind of point to another room. <laughs> like, like this is where it's going down. But I'm like, why is there like these bodyguards out here? I mean, that's literally, it just felt like something else was going on besides selling coral. I don't know what was happening. But I got my coral, I paid the money, I said thank you, and I got out of there. And I put that thing in my tank, and it grew and became really, really beautiful. And then um, I ended up moving to a different spot because my butterfly fish, my copper band, decided it was a great tasty snack. And so I had it for a while, like, down between the branches of an SPS where it was safe and still beautiful. And if I looked at just the right angle through the profile of the corals, I could see my blastos. And uh, the, the copper band figured out a way to get in there and just one by one ate them and ate them and ate them. And there was no way of saving them. There was nowhere to put them. It was just a matter of, okay, that you like that coral. I'm not going to buy those ever again. But, uh, you know, that happens. Scullies. Tim says, have you ever had any scullies? Scolemia. No, I don't think I have. Um... No, I, matter of fact, I have not. I, you know why? Because they're so expensive. <laughs> and I have seen some beautiful ones when I was in um, Michigan. Yeah, that sounds right. No, Minnesota. I always get those two mixed up. I think it was Minnesota. And I was in this fish store that had a scully tank. It was filled with master scullies. So the couple that owned the, the fish store, you know, the wife started the store and she got married and the husband loved those and so she just bought him every scully they can get their hands on and there was so i mean it looked like a forty thousand dollar aquarium because there's so many scullies and those things were like two thousand dollars each i mean it was insane and then someone murdered it like literally you know it was like a while later i don't know a year later two years later someone literally put something in the tank that just killed all the coral and they were devastated i mean they were like do we even keep the store open they were so upset because someone would just go in and just destroy these beautiful corals. There's always someone out there causing chaos. It's awful. But no, I can't keep up with that. Uh, I, can't, I couldn't afford that. And then at this point, copper band butterfly, don't think I'd want to try and put that kind of coral in my tank because I feel like it might just snack on it and destroy it. Uh, Kevin says, do the dendros move or split or relocate like anemones do? How do yours not interfere with the other corals so close? Don't they need room for growth? Yeah, they do. They need room for growth. I need to get those other corals off of them. It's time for me to get my arm in the tank, which I have not done in a super long time, and remove the pest anemones that are spreading and do some trimming and remove some zoanthids that are getting too close so those dendros can breathe because they are getting a little bit smothered right now. But no, they can't move on their own. They're, they're um, fixed in place. Hey, Corey, good to see you. Um, Huang says, I bought a rainbow open brain from a local fish store that wasn't doing well. I didn't know it had RTN. I had to cut it to save it. Do you think it'll survive doing well since the cut? I don't know. Uh, I don't have enough information based on what you told me. You're the person that sees it. But uh, if you happen to have revive, you could try dipping it in that. It could possibly help with some kind of infection and maybe what's left will grow into something beautiful again. Tim says, can you share with us your top five corals you rate very high? Uh, I really like the Red Planet, and it's just an Acropora. I'm an Acropora nut. Um, I really like the Blue Tord. I really like the Green Slimer. But then... Um, 
when it comes to LPS, I'm always looking at eight cans. I can't help myself. And I'll buy more of them and come home and they look just like the ones I already have. I'm like, oh, I didn't even get a different one because you like to mix it up like Skittles. Um, and then um, I really, really like maize corals. The Platygyra pinny is my favorite. And I have a chunky one in my tank that's being overrun. <laughs> it's about this big right now. It should be like this big because I've had it so long. But uh, it, it just, I love the, the maize striations between the ridges. It's so neat. And that's another one of those ones, again, you don't have to do anything. You just put it in the tank and let it grow. Just don't let anything else grow on top of it. Let's see. Matt says, I had some Frammer. I gave it up when I tore my tank down. I'm kicking myself because I have a new tank and want it back. Regret ever tearing the tank down. Had dendros also. Eh. I get it. Thanks, Tim. He was complimenting me on photo taking. Alex says, do you have any Duncans? I literally have two different colonies of Duncan in my tank right now. Uh, one is much bigger than the other. The other one is kind of between anemones and Duncans, and uh, there's other stuff happening, and it, they're just, they need some TLC. They need some space. Thomas says, my water today tested phosphate is still measuring zero. Do I do a water change twice a month or once a month? You know, Thomas, your tank isn't that big. You could do a 25% water change once a month and it'd be fine. If your phosphates continue to be zero, you're going to need to start dosing Neophos to bring them up because, you know, your tank's been running for a couple of years and tanks that have no phosphate uh, registered on their on their device, you know, on their test kit, tend to end up with dinoflagellates. And then you're going to have this whole other battle that you're going to really struggle to beat. So I'd rather see you dose some phosphate in that tank ASAP. <laughs> you know, Neo, uh, yeah, Neophos is the one you want to buy. I sell both. I sell two sizes of that bottle in my website. And I suggest you start dosing that to get some, reg you know, some measurable phosphate in the water before it's too late. Uh, Lord Thornton, tell me which coral you're asking about, because by the time I read this message, I don't know what I was showing you. Okay, here's a trident question. <clears throat> I set up my trident a week ago and calibrated it yesterday. The calibration helped, but the numbers it gives, particularly calcium, are a bit off from my hand test. 407 versus 415. You know what? You are that close, they are fine. That You're not going to ever have two things be identical measurements, but let's just round up. 407 would be 410, and 415 be 420. So you're talking about 410 to 420. You're there. That That number is totally fine. See. Tim says, since Caitlin's Reef is 75 degrees and doesn't have high flow, could it support a seahorse? Ah, uh, maybe. I hadn't even thought of that. I was kind of wanting to put in one more fish of some kind, but I don't want to overload the bio, bio load, you know, of that tank. Because there is no sump, there's no skimmer, there's nothing to filter the water. So the tank's been doing really well just being itself. And uh, so I, I don't want to overtax it. I was almost thinking maybe more firefish because they're so tiny and adorable. But yeah, seahorse might be a cool addition to that tank. I'd also like to get some pipefish in my main reef. So I'm looking forward to that happening soonish. John says, my frog spawn and hammer are thriving. Would that mean alveopora would live? I know Ghanis need manganese uh, dosing a lot. Yeah, I would say that you definitely could have alveopora. And I don't want to talk about manganese. <laughs> I dosed so much manganese and it never showed up on my test kit. I went through bottles of it, like four bottles, uh, which was a lot because it was pure, pure manganese. 
and for some reason it was um it just I could never get the number to budge off non detected non detected. Uh, Hillbilly Reefer says, I'm curious lately about potential benefits of running a lunar schedule on my SPS reef. If you were to run a lunar schedule, what light spectrum, white, blue, et cetera, and for how long? Uh, I actually do. I run lunar schedules on all my tanks because the lights offer that feature built in. So the Sky have it, the Radions have it, the Prime, the AI Prime has it. They all will match what's going on with the moon outside, whether it's full moon or new moon. And either my tank will be glowing or it'll be pitch dark, depending on what's going on outside. And I've been doing that for a long time. The lunar schedule can lead to coral spawning too. So it's, there is some benefit to that if you wanted to go that route. But it, I just let the light do it. I don't even tell it what color it needs to be. It just knows. Typically, I think lunar lights are almost always the white LED. Just very, very dim. And depending, I mean, there's been times where I would look at my tank and, you know, lights were out. And my tank is just glowing. I'm like, what is happening? And the radon's like, it's full moon tonight. You're getting full moon. <laughs> like, like you mean it. And, you know, then two hours later, the tank went dark. It's like, wow, that was a long full moon. And then other times the tank would uh, get dark early. I'm like, why is it so dark? I haven't even fed yet. It's because new moon, there's no light at all. I was like, oh, I missed it. So, yeah, if you can use what's built into the light, that can be helpful. Jerry's Little Reef says, do you have to be sure to feed each mouth on every, every time on the coral? When it comes to the uh, sun corals, you want to hit as many mouths as you can. The dendros, well, I mean, it's only a few polyps, so it's not that hard to hit them all. I mean, you're just in that vicinity. With hammer corals, again, you're going to get the, you're going to have this group of polyps. So as you're putting food in that area, it's going to land on all of them anyway. But do you have to get every last one of them? Maybe not. But it would be a good idea if you're if you are doing the target feeding to make sure everyone's getting something the you know the fungia have a single mouth so if you have five fungia you need to feed each one of them if you're trying to feed them with the like the sun coral colony while they share some skin they generally each polyp needs its own food source believe it or not uh, so it just comes down to the type of corals we're talking about uh, let's see blastos goniopora alveopora uh, they are different. They are more of a filter feeder. Their food is so, so fine. It's better for broadcast feeding where you mix up food in a, a solution and you pour it in the tank and the tank turns cloudy for, you know, 10 minutes to 30 minutes and just let the corals ingest it rather than trying to specifically hit every mouth. You just let all the mouths grab what they can. But when I do that, I only turn off the return pump and skimmer. I leave all the flow on in the tank so the food's moving. I don't want to just pour in a cloud and just sink to the bottom and sit on the sand. Uh, William says, I know you don't use GFO, but what are your thoughts on using it? Uh, you can use it. I just found it doesn't work for me. Uh, it may work perfectly for you. For me, I just use Phosphor Direct because it's easier. The, when you're using GFO, you put in a reactor, you have to rinse it, and you've got to like hook it up to your plumbing and then prime it to get that first burp of air out of there so that the fines don't belch into your tank and burn the gills of your fish or get any of the, the metal fines into the tank to get on some of the corals, right? So after you've gone through all that, you have to make sure that the media is tumbling slowly, just really, really barely moving, like a moon quake, like an earthquake, but a moon quake. So it's like... And then you have to make sure that it doesn't solidify. And you want to measure the output. And if the output is coming out zero and the input is going in as 0.25, it's doing its job. If it's going in at... 0.25 and coming out 0.25 it's done you have to put more in there if it turns hard as a rock you got to disassemble and break it up and get it out and refill it and it just was a, an expensive tedious task i i did gfo for about nine months and hated every minute of it it's just the whole thing was just so irritating to me and since my phosphates weren't budging i was like why am i doing this i mean i tried everything i tried different brands i tried different styles of reactors and got no traction at all. And then I stumbled on a bottle called Fossbuster Pro at the fish store. And I was like, what is this? And I used it and my phosphates came down. I was like, oh, that's what I'm gonna use from now on. And then, you know, I, I was buying it by the case and then they came out with phosphate control where you just drip it in. 
And then that got renamed to Phosphate RX, and I've been using that ever since. And it's just so much easier. I use it, what, five, six times a year? I, I spend like a minute counting some drops, and then the next day my phosphates are down, and then six, eight weeks later, I do it again. It's just, it's such a non-issue for me that I just have no desire to even consider getting back in the GFO process. And my tanks have never struggled, from what I can tell, with phosphate rising and then me dro no dropping it down. You know? It's just, I wish there was a nitrate RX. <laughs> that would be wonderful. But I just ordered some more of that resin from Brightwell. I'm going to hook that up to my tank to just bring my nitrates down. It worked before, and... Uh, then I took it offline because it was working too well. So I'm going to use less of it this time and not do a ginormous water change and just watch it just bring the number down and get it down and make it stay down. Uh, Douglas says, I have a devil's hand leather. Is there anything I should be doing for fast growth or other than stable parameters? Nope. Devil's Hand is super easy. It's a leather coral. They have no demands. They just do their thing. They grow and they become bigger. And, you know, if you do everything right, it becomes the size of a catcher's mitt. And it can drop babies. It'll literally just frag itself and throw babies. And you need to give those to other people because they'll, they'll take over your tank. David says, can you dose ChemiClean back-to-back -back, or should you run carbon in between treatments? You can run it back-to-back. -back. It's actually one of the things I recommend. If you have a tank that has a cyano situation that's not gone in three days, I don't even do the water change. I dose the tank again and continue the treatment for two more days to get rid of it. And then I do my big water change and run carbon. But um, that's just how I, I mean, it's, it's really easy to use. And it just does the job. So if you're in a situation where you need to dose a second time, you can. Whiskey Baron says, did you dose anything in your anemone tank before the teardown? Um, no, because it was part of the same ecosystem. It was part of the reef with the sump and all of its filtration. I dosed Prodibio into the tank, which of course went into the anemone cube. Um, and Prodibio is going to be iodine and it's going to be strontium, which those two numbers are never a problem in my tank because of using it every 15 days for <laughs> 13 years. It's uh, it's just so simple. To, you break the vial, you put it in, that's it. You have iodine and uh, strontium. And those two numbers are never a problem in my ICP test, which is really nice to know. And then the Bioptim and the BioDigest are uh, food and bacteria that I've been using ever since. So I would say, I can't think of anything I put in there. I mean, I know I killed some Aptasia in there with f -Aptasia, but that's not really dosing. That's more like murdering. <laughs> but no, uh, nothing went in that tank besides fish food. <coughs> and then my arm to clean it from time to time. Thomas, I hope you saw my answer to your question. I, I saw another super chat come in from you. Thank you very much for that. Um, hopefully, you will get your phosphates up a little bit. Lincoln Town says, have you ever tried using the Apogee power meter connected directly to a laptop? Thinking about biting the bullet and getting it seems to be the best bargain. Uh, I have not. I have always had an Apogee power meter, and I had the latest one, but... Um, I don't own a laptop. <laughs> I have the iPad. Um, before that, I had a MacBook Pro. I could have done it with that possibly, but I always just had the meter and I had someone next to me usually that'd come over and help and I would just rattle off numbers to them and they'd write them on a piece of paper and I would say what that number was near or what measurement I was at and I'd, I would just graph it out. And then I'd do something in Photoshop to like do an overlay and show where all the numbers were in the tank. And it's time to do it. It's 2023. I got to measure my par. So, but no, I've never done it with a laptop. Let me know how it goes for you. Let's see. Lord Thornton, Thornton says, are chalices SPS or LPS? I've heard them called both. I think they're LPS. They're actually listed on LPS on my website in the, critter, in the creature ID section. 
but um, I don't think it's SPS by any means. I, I wonder if it even classifies under LPS, to be honest, because it's kind of like one continuous potato chip with mouths on it. But um, yeah, it's kind of a weird one. I, I was actually second guessing myself on that one today when I was looking at them. Paul says, would you trust the Apex Salinity Probe without needing to calibrate it too often? I kind of just kind of keep an eye on it. Uh, I don't know that I trust it. I think I trust my refractometer more. Uh, I did get it to where it was giving me some consistent numbers for a long time. And recently it's been a little bit more sporadic, which means I probably need to clean the probe. And I haven't done that. And, uh, you know, I was, but I, you know, I, I, like I said, I eyeball it. It's on Fusion. It's, it shows on my screen but I don't let it affect my, my mental well-being, <laughs> and I definitely don't let it stress me out. I'm like, eh, because I can just grab three drops out of the tank and put it on a refractometer and double check and see what my number is. And then when I do the ICP test, they tell me also what they say my salinity is, so I can kind of compare my number against their number to see if I'm in the, in the right wheelhouse or not. ATF in the house says, did you mention whether Salaford flatworm exit can hurt anemones, LPS, etc.? No, it doesn't hurt them at all. It, it hurts the flatworms. But as the flatworms die and release their stuff into the water column, that can hurt your livestock. That's why it's so important to be siphoning them out daily, like a week in advance before you ever treat the tank. And then when you treat the tank, siphon them out as they're dying. Like quickly just go around and just keep slurping them out with airline tubing. I just go after the ones that are drifting around and get them out of the system into a bucket. And then after 15 minutes, I do the water change and I start running carbon immediately because their toxin is that bad. Kalon says, how do you feel about using a UV sterilizer? I was thinking about adding one to my Nuvo 40 gallon. It's two years old and I'm dealing with some red flatworms. Well, UV sterilizer won't get rid of flatworms. The flatworms would have to literally go through the UV sterilizer to die, and odds are they're not going to hitchhike their way in there. So I don't know that that's going to help you. Um, but like ATF was saying, you know, flatworm exit gets rid of flatworms. Airline tubing or a slightly larger tubing could be used to siphon them out one by one. Um, there's a velvet nudibranch that eats flatworms that you could put in there that could work its way around and act like a little hoover and slurp them up. Uh, the fish store over here, Fish Paradise, used to say the guy swore that the Blue Devil Damsels ate flatworms, but I don't know if that was true. I, I feel like if it was true, everyone would have had them and would have agreed with him. But he, he said they absolutely work in his tanks. Maybe he never fed the, fed the damsels, and so they had to eat the flatworms. I don't know. Burke says, I just lost my acans. They were big and full one day, and the next shriveled up and died a few days later. Parameters are stable and in range. You know, sometimes something will just die in our tank for no reason at all, but usually there's some kind of a cause, and we just had to correlate it. Like something stung it, something walked all over it, something chewed on it, you know, something pecked at it, something ripped it open, like peppermint shrimp, for example, can do a real number on acans and, uh, you know, just reach in their mouths and steal the food, and they just keep picking at it and picking and picking and picking. And then eventually the coral is like, okay, I give up. So that can happen. Um, I, I, I don't know, but um, those are some of the thoughts of what can happen to make stuff like that suddenly die. Haley said they dropped their tweezers down in the back of the overflow box. How can I get them out? You could use a magnet and a fishing line. Uh, Manuel says, I recently purchased rock anemones. Must they be fed daily? Do they move a lot? No, actually, they don't move a lot. They kind of find a spot and stick there. And they don't have to be fed a lot. You can feed them if you want once a week or so. And um, you have a choice. You can use pellet food. You can use little bits of krill on them. They'll, they'll be happy to capture it. And they are beautiful. They're colorful. They, they're a really nice addition to a tank. Uh, 
Um, w. Mar says, I recently had two big LTAs, long tentacle anemones, die back to back. I'm wondering if my girlfriend could have overfed them with this new food we got, Reef Blizzard. Um, I don't think the food would kill them <laughs> because usually if an anemone eats something and it's too much food, they will just regurgitate up a big blob and spit it out. And there's this thing in the bottom of your tank you have to throw away. That means you're overfeeding uh, a creature, right? But... Um, I can't even think of what kills a long tentacle anemone specifically. I mean, tank is too young, wasn't ready. Uh, tank is the wrong temperature. Some kind of water parameter. I mean, yeah, it's... You're... I don't think the food did it, but I don't know what did do it. But... Um, Hopefully you can get your tank stabilized out and then end up getting one that stays with you and, and does well. Um, ATF says, where can you get a flatworm siphon device? I actually made mine. So I took some rigid airline tubing and I jammed it into some flexible airline tubing. And then I, I took a, a lighter and I held it under the tip of the rigid to make a little tiny bend so I could get nooks and crannies. And I would just hold the rigid and I would just work my way through the tank. I mean, the rigid is like this long. And then this big, long piece of tubing so I could put into a bucket and I could get up on to, you know, a step ladder or a chair or my walkboard. It depends what tank I was working on. And Or with the 55, I just stood there on the floor. <laughs> and I would just work in the tank and I would, I would look for these flatworms everywhere and I would just slurp, 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 slurp. And with the airline tubing, you lose so little water. You could be vacuuming for an hour and have like this much water in the bucket. So you didn't lose a lot of water volume. So you're not topping off. You're not throwing off salinity. And if you have someone else with you, they can help you spot them. Um, whether they just tell you where they are or they use a laser pointer and they point to them for you. So you can, because you kind of go snow blind and you're just like, because you've been looking at them for so long, you just stop seeing them. And so a second pair of eyes can be really helpful in locating them to siphon them out. And that's what I did. Uh, can you take everything out, corals, and put them through a flatworm dip in buckets or troughs, then transfer everything back to the tank? Has anyone done this? It's not really effective because they're all over your rocks and in the rock work, too. You almost have to take everything out and do this. So it's just better to just do it in the tank. I mean, I've never been fearful of fat, flatworm exit, but I have a huge article about it on my website telling you exactly how I do it. And I highly recommend you read that. Matter of fact, I did a live stream about this exact topic, uh, flatworm exit and getting rid of them because people were just kind of like doing it half cocked. <laughs> they weren't, they were like, oh, well, yeah, so I didn't do a water change for two or three days. I don't know why a lot of my stuff's dying. And they, were, they just seemed so confused and, and laid back about it. I'm like, do you realize what you were doing? That is like the most dangerous procedure that has to be done specifically a certain way. And so I did a whole live stream talking about it. But the articles on my website, just type in flatworm exit Mila's Reef or, or remove flatworms Mila's Reef or remove flatworms Mila in Google, you'll find the article. And it goes through every bit of what to do and how to do it exactly right. And you won't lose livestock if you do it my way. So <laughs> I, I recommend that. I remember back when flatworms were such a problem, I kept the bottle of flatworm exit in my glove box in my car. And when I went to the fish store and I bought any kind of coral, I would open the bag put in a few drops and close the bag and drive home. So they were dipping on the way home. And then when I got home, I could just clean them off with some tank water and put them into my frag tank, or I could put them into my quarantine tank, or I could put them in my reef. But I was, every single thing that went through my tank went through flatworm eggs at that point. And getting a brand new frag and putting flatworm eggs did not hurt the corals at all. So whether it was zoanthids or LPS or whatever I bought, they just went through flatworm exit. And that way I didn't have to worry about getting in my tank because I definitely didn't want those darn things. Uh, w. Mars says, we've had one for over a year and added another recently. It was a different color. They touched a lot, so I thought maybe they stung each other. Yeah, see, now that's something that can happen. Sometimes corals can't, I mean, sorry, anemones can't hit each other uh, they can even have a little, how do you say it? A lillopathy, where a, li, a, li, a lillopathy, where they're actually chemically fighting each other across the the tank, you know, like across the room, and that stinging 
can happen between them, but I don't know why you said both of them died, so I'm a little confused. Um, you know the long tentacle and enemies need to put their foot down in the sand bed, right? But um, don't want them touching. It, it's If I were getting one, I wouldn't get a second one. But really, a better choice would be a bubble tip, I think. But we all have different tastes. So do all you can about reading about long tentacle and enemies. There's got to be dozens of articles in Google. And the more you read, maybe you'll come across some, some nugget of wisdom that you're like, ah, now I know what happened with mine. And you'll have like the, the perfect success. That is one. I think I tried one very early in the late 1990s. Had it for a while. Didn't really like the look of it. It was kind of boring. It was white and then it became tan. And I was like, eh. And uh, later on, I, I got myself a bubble tip anemone. I think... The first one I got was a green one. It was so pretty. And uh, the rest is history. I've been with them ever since, you know, for since 1996. Well, I think I got mine in 2002, maybe. So, oh, 21 years. Yeah, <laughs> it's a long time. And I still have the original one still to this day um, in my temporary tank right now, waiting for the new aquarium to go up. Let's see. Cody says, if flatworm eggs, it doesn't work on you affiliating polyclad flatworms. Yeah, I think polyclads are different. I think it works for red planaria and maybe for aeolids, which are the longer ones that kind of look like... Uh, what do they look like? <laughs> They're just longer with like a line down the middle and the end kind of has like a V. Um, the aeolids are more opportunistic. You know, they just they feed off the mucus of corals. They're not killing it. I th what he's talking about, the ones that, that are eating euphilia, that's a different flatworm entirely. I don't have the answer to that. So Dustin said he would take his euphilia out and suck them off with a pipette and then dip it in a gentle coral dip. Did this four or five times and they disappeared. But my article specifically is about red planaria because that was the one we were dealing with back in the day. Thomas, you're looking for uh, Neophos by Brightwell. N-E-O-P-H-O-S. ATF in the house, if you can post a picture in Club Milo's Reef of your flatworms, I'd appreciate it. Let's take a look and see what you're dealing with. And John Wright, I like the way you, what you said. This is a great place to stop our stream. I just want to thank you for your streams and videos and hope you know how much we all appreciate them. You know what? Um, I want to delve into a, a, a topic I've mentioned before here based on that statement. I thank you guys very much for the nice things you guys write to me. And I appreciate those compliments. You know, the when Caitlin died two years ago, a thousand people wrote the most wonderful things about her. And I kept saying if she had read these things, if she had known these things, her self-esteem would have been boosted a thousand percent because everyone had such wonderful things to say about her. And I've always said that we should say these wonderful things to each other now while we're alive and not say it after they're gone because it's backwards. We're doing it wrong. <laughs> we keep complimenting people when they're gone and they don't get to hear it. They're the ones that needed to hear it. Maybe they'd still be here. And I'm, you know, I'm not t talking about suicide, but I mean, the point is we should say things now while we can. We should seize the opportunity. And so every time I get a nice email, a nice post, a nice comment on the stream, whatever, I take that in. I It does not go over my head. I don't. It doesn't go to my ego at all because I'm not an ego guy. But I, I love it. You know, it's so nice to get appreciated when you do something for someone else or when you're trying to help others. And so thank you. And I appreciate that. And I encourage you guys to continue to thank people when they do things for you that because it'll make their day better. There was a time, this is like, a, I don't know, once in a while we have this giant truck go by with the claw. And the claw will stop in front of my house and it will reach down onto the ground and it'll take my pile of whatever, stick it in the truck and drive away. And so I saw the guy in front of my house, he was already done, and I ran out there and I went up to the side of his truck and it's a huge truck, so he's way up high and his windows rolled up and you know he's looking at a clipboard 
and I just kind of did the indication like roll down your window. And so he did. And I said, I know this is your job. And he was like, what? And so I said it again. I know this is your job, but I just wanted to say thank you for what you just did. And he got this huge smile on his face. And uh, that was it. I, mean, I wasn't there to complain. I wasn't there to say you messed up my lawn. <laughs> I was there to say thank you for doing this thing, even though technically they have to, right? It's their job. But at the same time, being told thank you for doing something is a wonderful thing. We should do it more often. And, you know, I, my mom was wonderful about this kind of stuff. She would bring, like, at the post office, you know, she, she'd mail things to me, right, and to others all the time. And around Christmas time, she would go to the post office with a little box of chocolates and a little tiny card, and she'd give it to the person that works the window that she's used to seeing, and she goes, just thank you for all your help this year. And that person loved her <laughs> because they got chocolate, you know? And it was just, those, I mean, this, my mom didn't just do it there. One time, she went to Frank's Tanks. She just got in my car and drove over there. And Frank told me about this later. I didn't even know. Your mom brought me chocolates. And she said, thanks for being such a good friend to you, Mark. And I was just like, yeah, that sounds like my mom. <laughs> but yeah, we should always do things for others. And, uh, you know, it's so easy to get caught up in our own stuff and, and get a little selfish from time to time. But I've always felt like it was important to share education and help others be successful with the reef tanks. And so when I get these little compliments, I, I really do appreciate them. And I hope you guys continue to do that for other people as well. Um, ATF in the house, you can just email it to me, sales at milosreef.com. Boom, right there. And that way I can see them. All right, uh, we're gonna wrap up here. It is, we've been talking for almost two hours, wow. I want to finally remind you guys that today is water test Saturday. I need to test my tank as well. I did my test last week. See, I did it right there. You can see it. And um, <clears throat> I got to do it again this week. I want to see where things are. I want to see where my phosphates are. I want to see my ridiculous nitrate number. I want to know how my alkaline calcium magnesium is doing. Uh, I will double check my graphs to see where my temperature is for the week. But you know, I checked it a couple days ago. That's pretty stable. And I'm going to do some water changes. I need to do one on Caitlin's tank. It has not had one in too long, but my salt water should be perfect right now. I'm going to double check it and make sure the salinity is right, the temperature is right, and the alkalinity. And if all three match, it's going into her tank. And that way, those, those critters and those fish will get some fresh salt water and make them smile a little bit harder. And I'd like to do some, a water change on the big tank too, and then refill my reservoir. I don't know if you guys have noticed I revived Reef Diaries starting about a week ago. And I do a reef diary when there's something to do, but so it's not every single day like it was, you know, initially. The first time I did it, we did it 131 days in a row. And um, that was a lot of work, but um, I didn't do anything with the tanks for the last couple of days. So that's why there was no reef diary. But when I do something with a tank, then I do a diary. And so I'm just gonna do them that way. And that way you have something to watch and kind of see what's happening with my tank on a more frequent basis, or you can know what I'm up to when it comes to how I take care of my tanks, because that's how you under, how a new hobbyist can understand what's involved to keeping a tank alive. Because a lot of times we're like, well, you need to buy this box, you gotta put this water in, you gotta have an RO system, you gotta buy test kits, you gotta get this kind of rock, you gotta have this kind of pump, you gotta get these kind of lights, and then they're kind of left on their own. And they're like, okay, I bought all those things, now what? And like, and what's this red stuff on my sand? <laughs> And so by having something that goes into the different things we do, whether it's just cleaning the lid on top of the tank or, or brushing off the top of the light fixture to, so it doesn't clog up and overheat or um, finding out your test kit expired and you need a new test kit and you know, compare the two and you're like, oh yeah, this is a terrible kit, throw it away. Like I did in Reef Diary this week, that's uh, something that benefits every hobbyist because a lot of times we just kind of get caught up in our own little routines and or we neglect and don't do the things and i had a lot of people tell me during the reef diary series that my videos were uh encouraging them to do more with their tanks too so it was contagious in a good way <laughs> so i hope you guys have a great weekend and that you continue to take good care of your tanks so they can be beautiful and you can share them with us at club Milo's reef on facebook bye guys <laughs>